You're listening to CFRN, a community of believers who trade for a living. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and how we do it, call toll-free 1-866-928-3310. And we'll send you out a no-obligation information kit absolutely free. 866-928-3310. The CFRN E-Mini Futures Cast is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phones, BlackBerry, and WebOS phones. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or at Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Are you ready, Steve? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, Bert. Well, all right, fellas. Well, it's go. You're listening to CFRN, the Christian Financial Radio Network. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. Over 85,000 titles. Choose from mystery, romance, religion, science, technology, business, New York Times bestsellers, even children's books. You name it, Audible has it. With 85,000 titles to choose from, you're sure to find the perfect audiobook for yourself or to give as a gift, and it's absolutely free. Just point your browser to audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. That's audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. And become a part of the audiobook revolution by downloading your free audiobook today. audibletrial.com forward slash CFRN. Hey, trader, want to get rich quick? Well, good luck with that. If, on the other hand, you actually want to learn how to trade, the place to be is www.cfrn.net. Tune in Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern, for our daily devotional, and then spend the next three hours learning how it's done from professional traders who actually trade for a living. That's www.cfrn.net. Every trading day from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern. CFRN, a community of believers who trade for a living. Good afternoon, traders, and welcome back to the CFRN E-Mini Futures Cast. This is the daily broadcast of Indeterminate Length, where we discuss all things E-Mini, along with some really big ideas on the finer points of trading gold, bonds, crude, sugar, the euro, and even T-bills. Joining us today from our studios in Boston, Mr. Michael Bork. From our trading desk in Chicago, Mr. Burton Schlichter. Now, to get things started, let's go to our host and founder in Studio A, overlooking South Mountain, America's largest city park. Here's Dwayne. Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back. Today is Friday, 6th day of October 2017. Happy Friday. Everybody's been working for the weekend, and, well, by golly, here it is. Sure enough. Hope you're having a great Friday. Hope you got great plans for the weekend. Hope you plan to spend some quality time with your family, of course. That's always important. Let's jump over to the numbers. Michael won't be with us today. He had to do planes, trains, and automobiles. So I think I even heard him say something about a bus, so... Who knows? Anyway, on Monday, he'll give you a recap of everything that happened today in the live training room. I do have the chart up of the S&P 500 E-mini futures. If you cannot see the chart, if you would like to see the chart, if you'd like to participate in the discussion via the chat box, go to our homepage at CFRN.net. On the right-hand side of the page, click the big microphone. Follow the instructions. Within about 30 seconds, you'll see the charts and in the chat box. You only have to register 
once per month. You get an email every day that has a link in it, and when you're ready to join the show, just one click and you're in. The other option is youtube.com forward slash CFRN forward slash live. Whenever we're live, we're broadcasting on that channel. Rest of the time, you just go to youtube.com slash CFRN. That's in case you happen to miss a show. Now, the S&P did a fine job of running up and hitting our highest weekly trading zone on the S&P, 2548-49, and then it spent from by noon yesterday till about 8 o'clock this morning, just consolidating right at it, just above that zone. And then this morning, we got a leg down, a retracement, back up to the zone. Typically, we would touch it to confirm that it's going to be good resistance, but just like Fibonacci weekly trading zones are an area. Yes, they do give you a, sp a specific point on the chart, both fibs and the zones, but we always have to remember that they're an area. Okay, so you get a leg and a retracement, and price has been basically sideways for the last hour and a half. These are 30 minute candles. On Wednesday night, we had suggested being long the S&P at 2539. And so that was good for a 10 point move. Unfortunately, I crashed my charts yesterday. And so everything got wiped out. We'll put them back together today, I guess. Um, and then last night on the S&P, we're looking to sell 2546, which is right about there. <clears throat> so 2546 546 well the zones 4849 so as we talked about in the partners workshop last night I like to get at least two points away from the zone because it's sort of a magnetic attraction for lack of a better term and even though from 46 we made a drop all the way down to 43 and a quarter so that's 2.75 two and three quarter points it still pulled it back up but there's other factors at work there as well Important prices, important areas are almost always tested. So get back above 46. And on this drop, we've put in a low down at 41.50. Now we'll call it 42. So four point move here. So a lot of consolidation at that zone. A lot of consolidation, many hours at that zone. It took two days to go from zone to zone. In fact, the zone down below was 13.14. We never actually hit that zone. Thirteen, fourteen, and the Globex open, which I always highlight with a yellow arrow, was right there. Sunday night Globex open, and so we meandered for a couple days till we hit the zone overhead, consolidated for about a day, and then, by comparison, took a pretty brisk trip up to the zone overhead. Consolidation, leg, retrace, leg, and now 
just kind of Friday afternoon sideways. Not that big things can't happen on a Friday afternoon. They can. I've seen them happen. Okay, let's take a look at the numbers around the globe. Start with the U.S. Let me make sure I've got the most recent numbers. All right, the Dow is currently down 33 points. NASDAQ is down a little over 8. S&P 500 down almost 8. And the Russell 2000 down 5.5. Those are the cash markets. In the commodity basket, crude oil is down $1.51. That's almost 3%, trading 49.28 last. Gold is up today. Go gold. $3.80 trading $12.77 last. In the Asian markets, color of the day there was green. At the closing bell, the Nikkei was up 62 points. Shanghai was up 10 and the Hang Seng was up 78. No movers or shakers, but all green. Uh, not so much the same for the European markets. The FTSE closed up 15 points. The DAX closed down 12. And the CAC was down 20 points at the closing bell. So no movers, no shakers. Sort of quiet trade there in Europe. And in the U.S., uh, you know, it's been up, up, and away all week. And, of course, the jobs report today is getting the blame for this downturn in the S&P. But interestingly enough, Gary Cohn, the National Economic Council Director and Top Economic Advisor to President Donald Trump, this morning said the White House was actually excited by the latest jobs report, which showed that the U.S. economy unexpectedly lost 33,000 jobs during September. Cohn said, we at the White House are very excited about the numbers. You're right, there is some noise in the number because of the hurricane. And as you said, you discount that noise out. This was in an interview with Bloomberg TV. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released the report this morning saying that much of the softness in the jobs number was due to the impact of the hurricanes Harvey and Irma, which slammed into the Gulf Coast in September. Cohn said that rather than the headline jobs drop, the Trump administration was positive about other more promising statistics in the report. You're looking through the numbers, and you're looking at the wage growth, and you're looking at the unemployment number, which is the real good news here. Average hourly earnings grew 2.9% year-over-year in the month, tied for the highest rate since the recession, but still lower than the pre-recession average. The unemployment rate also dropped to 4.2%, its lowest since February of 2001. These numbers may have also been affected by the hurricanes. The acting BLS commissioner, William Wotrowski, said in a statement that the higher wage number reflects both ongoing labor market trends and possible effects of the hurricanes. A White House representative echoed Cohn's comments, attributing the weak headline number to the hurricanes in a statement to Business Insider. Today's report shows the devastating impact of this unprecedented hurricane season. While many displaced could not work, the economy remained strong. The stock market has hit new highs. The unemployment rate fell. To grow our economy, we must enact tax cuts and reforms to make America more competitive. Cohen said that to continue these positive trends in the labor market, it was necessary for the government to pass Trump's massive tax package. Got to do it. Got to lower those taxes.
the NRA is in the news today. Most of us probably didn't know what a bump stock was before this tragedy in Las Vegas. The Anti-Gun Control National Rifle Association, the NRA, said Thursday that it supports a push to regulate so-called bump stocks, the devices police say the gunman in the Las Vegas massacre used to make his semi-automatic rifles fire continuously like fully automatic weapons. The NRA believes that devices designed to allow semi-automatic rifles to function like fully automatic rifles should be subject to additional regulations. Uh, Wayne LaPierre, NRA Executive Vice President, said in a joint statement with another NRA leader that the NRA stand was expected to boost Republican support for an effort spearheaded by Democrats to ban the devices. Clearly, it's something we need to look into. Uh, that comment from Paul Ryan, House Speaker. So, I'm not 100% certain how the bump stock works, but you know what? We'll ask our friend the internet. How does a bump stock I heard someone loosely explain it on the news. The equipment to alter a semi-automatic weapon and have it fire like an automatic weapon is known as a bump stock. A bump stock is a piece of plastic or metal molded to the lower end of a rifle. The device allows a shooter to fire dozens of rounds in seconds by harnessing the gun's natural recoil. Okay, a rifle with this type of mechanism is optimal with a high capacity magazine that can hold between 60 and 100 rounds and a hand grip that allows a shooter to push the rifle away from the body to bounce or bump the weapon into the trigger finger. Hmm. Well, if you're going deer hunting, I suspect you don't Another need one day of those. At the office. That's just, just my guess. You can do without that. Also in the news today, Trump has plans to decertify the Iran nuclear deal, the deal that should have never happened. Trump plans to decertify Iran's compliance with the Iran nuclear deal next week. Now this could stir up some trouble and declare that the Obama era pact is not in U.S. interest. Several news outlets reported Thursday that Trump reportedly does not plan to scrap the agreement entirely as he has repeatedly indicated he would like to do. Trump has said the agreement which exchanged the lifting of sanctions for Iran's promise to curb its nuclear program was a terrible deal for the U.S. and for security in the Middle East. Decertifying the deal will put the matter in the hands of Congress, giving lawmakers two months to determine the next move. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders confirmed that Trump had reached a decision on the issue and planned to announce it soon. Well, this will be interesting, no doubt. I wonder how Iran's going to respond. <clears throat> Special Counselor Robert Mueller's investigators reportedly 
recently interviewed a British spy, Christopher Steele, who compiled a dossier of alleged personal and financial dirt Russia had collected on President Trump. The meeting with Steele took place in Europe in recent weeks. Steele looked into Trump's Russian ties for a private U.S. firm, and his report was circulated in Washington last fall. President Trump has dismissed Steele's findings as phony stuff, in quotes, although the FBI is investigating to see whether it can corroborate Steele's claims. Mueller's team is investigating Russia's attempt to influence last year's election in Trump's favor and possible collusion by Trump associates. Good Lord, we'll be holding our next election and they'll still be hammering away at this thing. I mean, the guy got elected. Just, you know, lend him your support. Lend him your prayers. If you don't like him, you didn't vote for him, well, he's president now. So pray that he makes the right decisions in the best interest of every American. As more news comes out on what happened in Vegas, uh, Stephen Paddock, the gunman who killed 58 people on the Las Vegas Strip before taking his own life, rented two rooms at Chicago's Blackstone Hotel overlooking the Lollapalooza Music Festival in August, but never checked in. Hmm. The two rooms Paddock reserved had a clear view of the outdoor festival, which took place two months before he fired down on a country music festival crowd from a 32nd floor room at a Las Vegas hotel. The four-day Lollapalooza event attracted hundreds of thousands of people, including former President Barack Obama's daughters, Malia and Sasha. Paddock also reportedly reserved rooms overlooking the Life is Beautiful show near the Vegas Strip late last month. So, this guy been plotting for a while. The question is why? I mean, on the outside looking in, he's a guy who had it all. He had the money, even had a couple of airplanes, come and go as he please, no worries, nobody to answer to. What was he so angry about? Representative... Tim Murray, Republican from Pennsylvania, told House leaders uh, yesterday that he would step down from his seat. The married eight-term congressman, an outspoken proponent of abortion restrictions, announced a day earlier that he would not seek re-election after a news report claimed that he had urged a woman with whom he had had an affair to get an abortion. House Speaker Paul Ryan said Murphy had sent him a letter of resignation, effective October 21st. It was Dr. Murphy's decision to move on to the next chapter of his life, and I support it, Ryan said in a statement. That doesn't look good, does it? The House of Representatives has actually passed a budget, a $4.1 trillion budget, Along party lines, 219 to 206, 18 Republicans voted against the resolution, as did all of the Democrats. The legislation primes the GOP for a tax code rewrite. We need to pass this budget so we can help bring more jobs, fair taxes, and bigger paychecks for people across this country. That from House Speaker Paul Ryan. The Senate is not expected to accept the $200 billion in required federal spending cuts from the House budget. The upper chamber's proposal would allow $1.5 trillion to be added to the deficit over the next decade, but the House plan requires a tax proposal that doesn't add to the deficit. What's a half a trillion? Film studio executive Harvey Weinstein has paid at least eight settlements to women who accused him of sexual harassment. Well, hey, that's Hollywood. 
The allegations against him span nearly three decades. Women, including actress Ashley Judd and former Weinstein employees, say he invited them to hotel rooms and made unwanted advances, sometimes appearing naked in front of them. One former employer employee said he promised to advance her career if she would have relations with him. Judd said he asked her to watch him shower or let him massage her. In a statement, <laughs> Weinstein said he came of age when all the rules about behavior and workplaces were different and that he is trying to do better. He'll take a leave of absence from his company. Okay. Here comes another storm. This one's called Nate. Tropical storm Nate formed and quickly strengthened in the Caribbean, already killing at least 20 people in Central America as it pushed north. At least 11 of the deaths occurred in Nicaragua, where thousands evacuated their homes due to flooding. The storm is expected to strengthen as it continues over warm waters toward Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. National Hurricane Center forecasters said Nate could reach the Gulf Coast, possibly in Florida's Panhandle near Pensacola, as a Category 1 hurricane with top sustained winds of 85 miles per hour on Sunday. The threat of the impact is increasing, so folks along the northern northern Gulf Coast should be paying attention. My goodness. Mm, just when you thought it was safe to go back home. The international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons has won the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Their work is to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and its groundbreaking efforts towards a treaty prohibiting them. The Nobel Committee chair said, We live in a world where the risk of nuclear weapons being used is greater than it has been for a long time. Citing the crisis over North Korea's nuclear program as an example, in July, 122 United Nations member states signed the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons pushed by ICANN, but so far, no nuclear powers have signed on. Well, you know, if you've got nukes, I don't suspect you're going to give them up. That's why this deal with Iran is going to be very interesting. Netflix shares jumped by 4% to an all-time high yesterday after the video streaming company announced that it was hiking its monthly subscription fee by a dollar to 10.99. Now that's interesting because the last time they played with the prices, uh, shares took a, a massive hit, uh, but they jumped 4% yesterday. New customers will take the hit right away and existing customers will see their fee rise over the next few months. Netflix's premium four-stream family plan, which also offers some content in ultra HD 4K format, also will go up from $11.99 to $13.99 per month. Hikes have been expected as Netflix increases its spending on programming, which will rise by a billion dollars to seven billion dollars in the coming year. The second season of Netflix hit Stranger Things debuts later this month. And that's not one I've seen, so I can't, not much I can tell you about that one. All right, let's take a quick run through these markets here. The S&P, zone to zone, and now we have a situation. We walked the zone from 12 noon yesterday till what did I say eight o'clock this morning I made a drop retracement another leg down and then sideways there's our all-time historic intraday high right there 
All right. Now. As I said, Okay, I really need that to cooperate. Yeah, that's not exactly cooperating. <clears throat> Hmm. All right, well, let's take a different approach. What do we got here? All right, well, this is crude, so we can at least take a look at crude. Big move today. Okay. I don't know why my chart is showing that gap. In the hourly chart, there is no gap. There we go. Now it's gone. Okay, so yesterday we had a thousand dollar per contract move to the upside. From 5005 up, we put in a high at 5122, and then last night the alert, which I'll put out there so you can grab a screenshot if you'd like to. If you're using the GoToWebinar. app then just up top where it looks like a camera it is click it there you go okay okay so last night on crude we said to consider selling 50 50 if you had the opportunity which we did this first move didn't quite touch it went right back up see that's that same move i was talking to you about on the s p you move down comes back, confirms that this is now going to be good resistance. And then down we go. Last night in the workshop, we talked about the very opposite of that. Because this is what we call a hot knife through butter. When price hits a weekly trading zone, the most likely thing that will happen is this, consolidation. Second most likely is rejection. And then the third most likely is where it slices through as if it's not even there. Okay. Normally when it slices through, it will pull back to the zone, consolidate, and then continue in the direction that it sliced through. This did not do that it went the opposite way. This is also why we typically will, uh, like on the S&P, use a two-point uh, bracket around the zone before we get long or get short, just to get an idea of whether the market has made up its mind, which way it's really heading. Now, on this move here, 50-50, uh, 50, 70 is the zone, so 20 cents is the number we were looking at for 50, 50, and it took us right down to the zone below, which is 49, 70, 75, and it 
did do a little bit of consolidation there. These are 30 minute candles and the complete drop was $1,400 and now sideways. We did have one final zone below us and that's all the way down at 48. I don't think we'll see that today. But keep in mind the carryover effect of the zones and so on the Globex open Sunday night unless this thing really firms up here it's very possible we could see something or a further drop down towards that 48 area on Sunday night the markets open at 6 p.m. even though uh, we have Columbus Day coming uh, stock market is open futures are open bonds are closed Okay, on the Russell. God, that looks so confusing. Okay, I think John's ready to join us. John, welcome to the show. Are you there? So I was. Can you hear me now? Yeah, got you. Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Now is that, now you can hear me. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Good. How, good. Okay. How are you? Sorry, I, I, I pretty good. I was mute, muted on this end. Um, the uh, listen, the, the Nasdaq's uh, taken off here. Uh, we're going to hit new highs in a minute, um, and. Uh, the, it's going to probably drag the rest of the markets up with it. We, we already kind of called it turn here. And um, this market's kind of unstoppable. And there is this uh, supposed news that create, you know, apparently, I don't know how they kind of factor it into the equation, but supposedly uh, there's about a million people, more, a million more people working or 900,000 more people working today than a month ago. Uh, somehow, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, you know it, that would explain. I mean, that's logical because with a three percent GDP, there should be a lot more people working. So uh, the this number, I'm pretty sure this number is going to be upwardly revised next month uh, because this is the first negative jobs number in about seven years or something. It's kind of a big deal. You know, they had one before that went a bit negative and that got upgraded, so they managed to avoid um, breaking the trend and I'd be no, they're you know, blaming I mean, this, a lot of it on the uh, hurricanes yeah exactly and uh, and uh, it, you know I think there's some some merit to that uh, but it, it it is a bit alarming to, to, to get you know to get a very bad jobs number because uh, it is a kind of a warning sign that, uh, you, you know, if we've got a couple of these, two or three of these, the market will tank. There's no, no doubt about it. But uh, just one, uh, one, uh, the market might be able to skirt skirt this one. And the uh, market's so powerful. You know, I did a bit of analysis. Uh, up until yesterday, we've been up 20 days since uh, since the, since 22,000. And if we, we, we only, uh, right now, we've only got, 260, wait a minute, two, 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 four, there's about 245 uh, points to go to, to uh, 23,000. And um, if we get there before Wednesday, it'll be a new record, new speed record for the fastest thousand point up, up move. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think we're probably going to make it. You know, uh, I think the market will get through this. Uh, cl classic behavior is they usually knock it down and then it rally it in the afternoon. And if we continue this trend, uh, we we'll probably hit a new high Sunday night, and then we might just keep going again into into Monday and have another strong week. You know, regardless of anything, this is a this is an enormous week that we've had this week, uh, and also the. Um, 
the T's. Let me see. The, yeah, look at the tech, the tech index, the, the the daily, the tech index, technology bull index, is at an all-time high right now. That's very bullish. The semiconductors also at an all-time high. You know, this is incredibly bullish. Where these two things are leading, and the Nasdaq is is almost an all-time high here. So it's a very very bullish indeed. And Nvidia which was knocked down a bit over the last few days is starting to get its mojo back but the most most amazing thing of all is uh, the which remember we called this uh not this last um, monday but a previous monday we call monday or tuesday we called the lows on the fangs and they've basically been going up ever since except for last monday they had, or the monday this week they had a bit of a hiccup and then they got got back uh, to uh, you know they got their mojo back, and they're very powerful now. These these fangs are going to go parabolic. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, uh, and 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 they uh, you know look, we're coming up to earnings. You know the, these aren't going up for ever. For, for somebody's leaked the the uh, the uh, earnings. Probably you know they're going to come in better than expected. And uh, all of them, even Priceline. You know if these things all gap up with better earnings, I mean it's going to electrify this market. Um, so I, I, I think you're seeing signs of very good signs of things ahead. Now that the <clears throat> now that the fangs are back on track, I mean these are very powerful. They're not just you know they give people confidence to, to see the leaders ship back in the fangs. I think is very very positive indeed. Uh, the the farmers started open pretty strong this morning, but they got knocked down. The LABU actually sold it up around 92. And went short, and actually we have a cover here at 90, because it looks like it wants to go back up again. And um, we actually got into the VIXs earlier on. The UVXY is around 18 and 45 or so. We just sold them up around 1920. They might go back up again. I mean, I'm not, what I'm saying may not be, you know, it's it's not cast in stone. If if the market were to turn down, the VIXs will go higher. The gold was pretty hard to pick this morning because they kind of really knocked it down a big, big time, <clears throat> down to that uh, 20, to, you know, we sort of had a fail-safe number around the 1264, 1263, and that's when we went back in. And also on the, uh, we were actually short from last night into the into this right down. I just said short the metals and stay short. And we covered, um, around about 1264, 1265. And the same on the silver at around 1640s or so. And then they shot up suddenly and um, uh, we just actually sold them just here on the highs and also got into the gold stocks. The nuggets performed very well so far. Uh, that's a good sign. Uh, obviously, if we go a bit higher here, I think uh, we'll be get, going back in, you know, back along the metals uh, for sure, because they might be, um, you know, they might any any kind of a day like this where you have got such a big reversal, it could, uh, you know, the way I see it is there may be a bit more work to do. We might come back down to the twelve seventy and the sixteen sixty or so, and then we could go back up after that. But it might be different. Usually, that's off what usually happens, but. You know, you can never say never. I think if we if we start getting above uh, 1278 and the 1685 on the silver, I think we're, we're probably going to have another run to the upside. Uh, one of the good things that's happening today is all of the grains are moving higher. And I think this is a significant development <clears throat> because uh, um, it kind of looks like the real deal. And... Uh, if we get about 975 on the soybeans and 3 320 or so on the on the soy meal i think uh, i think i think we're probably going to have a, a shot at uh, getting back over 1000 on the beans and uh, you know around 330 or so on the on the soy meal the wheat also was a bit doggish in the last few days but it's starting to come back which is a pretty good sign <clears throat> so uh, also the cotton made a big reversal this morning, we we actually got lucky. We kind of uh, reversed on the cotton around 68, 
or even or even 6790 i think and it uh, it's at 69 right now which is a i, I didn't honestly i didn't expect that to happen but it's uh, it suddenly turned around and also the coffee which you know got hammered down to 124 yesterday i think we mentioned it on the show and it's back to 130 uh, so i think you know i think you have to say now the coffee's probably bottomed uh, this was a pretty big deal you know going up this much and i definitely be buying more if it breaks 130 on the upside so uh, the you know it's been quite an interesting marketplace altogether here in the in the last couple of days and you know it's it's hard it's uh, the you know it's, it's look the jury's still out on the markets here this afternoon no the nasdaq's coming off a bit that's not such a good sign because you know the the s p and co are are uh, weak you know and uh, if they start breaking down further that'll actually help the u the uvs go higher the uv exercise and um and it might you know it might mean we're in for a bit of a bigger correction than than just the flash in the pan we had this morning so far because the, the, the this the, this nasa had so you know, I actually just got a sell signal on the NASDAQ at 6067 a minute ago. So uh, it's starting to come off here. But it might be just, uh, look, if it, as long as it doesn't come back too much, I think we'll be okay on, on the NASDAQ because these, these uh, fangs are really strong today. I mean, they're, they're pretty amazing what's going on. I want to take a look at a daily chart here for a minute on the S&P and... Well, that thing, it's relentless. Uh, bullish cross, price pull away, price pull back, and away we go. Uh, yeah, where does this thing... Let me... Uh, a little fib magic, and uh, if we take... Let's see... Let me try using a continuous contract and see what it brings up. Hmm. So, did you hear something about some piece of paper that they found in this guy's uh, in Vegas in his room? No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, they. It sounded like it was somewhat of a big deal. I don't know. I don't know why this won't take the continuous symbol. I had a problem with my charts yesterday, and they uh, collapsed on me. Well, it's not going to give me a continuous, but I kind of wanted to highlight just how far we've moved since the beginning of the year. I mean, we, we came into this year. I'm not going to get back there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be able to pull it in. What do you show as the? What price were we trading first of the year on the S and P 500? Do you show it? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, that's one of these damn things that happens from time to time. Uh, the um, yeah, the market's coming off a bit here right now. It's not such a good good thing. Do you, do you show um, a price for the S and P back in January when the year started? Yeah, yeah just 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 because I think the first month we traded uh, I think we traded negatively the first month or the first week. Because everybody, you know, everybody's got their saying, uh, as the first week goes, so goes the year. And I think we disprove that theory. Uh, the only... Uh, I just want to... Yeah, we were... Uh, January, we were uh, about uh, 22, 27, somewhere like that. Okay. No, a bit more. Uh, looks like we were around 20, the low is 2240. 
Yeah. So just this last leg up from August um, 21st to today. I mean, we could pull all the way back to 2,500, and that would be just a 38% retracement. If we pull back to 2,480, it's 50%, and that looks to me like a good area. I mean, that's just enough to send everybody screaming, the sky is falling, and then uh, it's nothing more than a good buying opportunity, and prices could continue higher. Uh, maybe twenty five eighty. Uh, what's your short term projections to the upside? Do you have any? Uh, well, remember I said we might have a hundred point rally in the S and P <clears throat> from the base that we broke out of, and we're up. Uh, well, we've been up. I don't know what's going on here today with this. It's just crazy. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we we uh, we got up about fifty points off that. Was it, we were around twenty five hundred when the rally started, right? Or was it a bit lower? So when today? No, no, no. Uh, when when this rally started? Hold on a minute. It was um, well. The last leg yeah, the, up yeah, started no, it started August twenty first. It started at twenty three seventy. It started at twenty. 2400 that was in june and then this last breakout yeah started at 2450 so we've gone up about 100 points since then to where we are right now it started at 24 actually the low was 2425 but it kind of broke up 2475 you could call it so we, we could have you know we could still get to 2575 or maybe even 2600 2600 Yeah, I just ran a FIB extension on this last leg up, and that put it at 2580 if we get 100% mm -hmm. extension. So, yeah. you know, today uh, may be an anomaly. Uh, yeah, by the way, did you hear the, the – remember we mentioned on the show several weeks ago that we thought that the net gains had risen to about $5 trillion since the election. Uh, they're now at $5.12 trillion. Really? And that probably, yeah, it probably puts the global gains at around 13 trillion, which is an unbelievable number. Um, so, uh, in, and just in the last few days, uh, take a look at Brazil, BRZU. It's had a phenomenal run up. Um, the euro, euro's been making new highs, just kind of came off a little bit today. The Indian market's been performing phenomenally. The Chinese market's been going through the roof, led by Baidu and Baba. The two of them uh, have been... B-R-Z-U right there. Yeah. Uh, you know, Brazil got... You see where it, it, it dropped down? It lost the, all of the gains of the year in one day back in uh, May. Remember that? And uh, and it subsequently... It, it's literally doubled. It, was, it got down to 25 on that index, and it's up to 50. Uh, have you heard, of, uh, we, we talked the other day about Goldman Sachs is considering opening a uh, Bitcoin trading desk. Yeah, I saw that, or yeah. A, or a yeah. cryptocurrency trading desk. Uh, i got to kill this video. Okay, here we go. Uh, Fidelity CEO, Abby. So tired of those commercials. Uh, Fidelity CEO, Abby Johnson, now they manage about 2.3 trillion, I think. Uh, surprised a tech conference this spring, uh, so this is not really new news, by revealing that the brokerage giant didn't just study cryptocurrency, it was actually mining the digital assets and making money while doing so. Turns out Fidelity has been at this for three years using its own computers to harvest the digital currencies Bitcoin and Ethereum, which today trade for around $4,300 and $300 respectively. Uh, Hadley Stern of Fidelity Labs tells Fortune that the U.S.-based mining operation is very modest. However, 
In the Undisclosed Profits, CEO Johnson reportedly told the conference that mining is actually making a lot of money, or mostly the result of cryptocurrency's dramatic rise in value. Bitcoin traded as low as $200 in early 2015, while the newer Ethereum was just $8 at the start of this year, and it's at $300 now. And our coin is built on the Ethereum blockchain, not the Bitcoin. Uh, those profits are nice, of course, but for Fidelity, they are not the point. Stern says the real purpose of the mining is to learn about the market itself. Think of it as an experiment. The real reason we began mining and still do is to learn how the network works, how consensus works, how difficulty levels work. Stern adds that Fidelity's mining project is not sophisticated compared to professional operations, which involve companies, most of them in China, although the biggest one here in the U.S. is run by uh, John McAvee. Uh, Fidelity continues to learn valuable lessons, including uh, about recent campaigns by miners to create so-called forks in the blockchain which serve as an immutable record of all cryptocurrency transactions. The most famous fork is when they rolled out Bitcoin Cash. The lessons Fidelity is learning could give it a valuable advantage at a time when other big financial institutions are dipping their toes into the world of cryptocurrencies, which are together worth well over $100 billion today. Hmm. Now, despite what Jamie Dimon said, in the last month, J.P. Morgan has begun handling customer orders for Bitcoin-related financial instruments, while Goldman Sachs has stoked rumors that it may be opening a trading desk dedicated to digital currencies. And there was also, I saw a headline this morning, uh, see if I can find it, Switzerland. Now, the one out of Switzerland, Swiss Public University. Swiss Public University begins accepting Bitcoin. Switzerland's Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts now accepts Bitcoin for tuition. The public institution is taking the cryptocurrency as payment for student-related bills through a partnership with Bitcoin Suisse AG, as might be expected, the university itself won't handle the Bitcoin. Rather, the brokerage firm will exchange incoming payments into Swiss francs on a weekly basis, according to an announcement. The immediate adoption by most students is not expected. However, only those who are savvy about finance or are interested in pursuing an education in this area are expected to choose the payment method. This move makes it the latest publicly funded higher education institute to embrace Bitcoin as an alternative payment following the King's College of New York, the University of Nicosia in Cyprus, and the University of Cumbria in the United Kingdom. Yet the move is perhaps an unsurprising one given the interest the university has shown towards the tech to date. Researchers at Lucerne are involved in a number of blockchain initiatives, including an Ethereum-based identity solution being spearheaded by the city of Zug. The university is also a member of the nonprofit Crypto Valley Association, a working group dedicated to companies and startups in Switzerland that are using the tech. Uh, and in corporation there, uh, it's a whole lot different than the U.S. It's not cheap. Boy. <coughs> Sorry. Or is it not you? Uh, oh, and the Swiss municipality, uh, where the Swiss are really, really buy, buying into this, the Swiss municipality of Chicasso is going to let residents pay their taxes in Bitcoin. According to a statement put out by the mayor, community on Switzerland's southern border with Italy is vying with Zug to be the country's cryptocurrency hub. Zug, which styles itself as Crypto Valley, launched a pilot last year in which it started accepting Bitcoin payments for municipal services. The pilot was a, apparently a success, so they have kept the program running. Uh, crypto, crypt, Cryptopolis is going one further by accepting 
Bitcoin for small tax payments up to a value of 250 Swiss francs. So, you know, despite China, despite Jamie Dimon, uh, it looks like it's onward and upward for this thing. It really does. What are your thoughts there, John, long term? Is this going to stand the test of time? John? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Uh huh. Yeah, it kind of looks that way. Yeah. By the way, uh, we made a little bit of an upward uh, notch on Trump's uh, approval rating today. We finally got to 46, uh, which I think he deserves for all the things he's been doing in the last week or two. And um, uh, it looks like it's probably going to keep notching higher. It might, might get back over 50 here, which would be a big deal for him if that happens. Maybe uh, some of the naysayers will finally get the memo that, uh, you know, there's only one reason this market's making all the time records every day, and it's because of him. Uh, you know, it's, uh, he's the driving force behind it. And uh, it's the ultimate approval rating. I think uh, you can you can trash all, all the approvals ratings that have been out there because they're not worth anything. The one that is worth something is the Dow at 23,000 when we get there, or 22,750 today. Uh, it's a pretty good place to be, uh, or five trillion in net worth. You know, uh, it might be minus five trillion if Hillary got in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something's wrong with my charts. I can't. I can't get them to switch. I'm going to end up having to shut the platform down and then reboot it later. Anything else you wanted to cover or talk about today? No, listen, uh, I've got some things going on, so uh, okay. great to talk to you. Thanks very much for the invite. You bet. And, have, uh, a have a great weekend. Have, you too. All the best. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. So tuition, taxes, municipal services, gas bill, water bill. Uh, looks like it's here to stay. Now, keep in mind, that's, this is not just Bitcoin, and it's not just Ethereum. From the way it looks, uh, those may be the big boys on the street, but there's a whole lot of other boys on the street, and some of them have turned some nice coin, <laughs> to say the least. So, a bit distressing that I can't pull up these other charts, and I don't quite follow why. I had an issue yesterday and the whole thing came tumbling down. And so they need to rebuild. But look at this volatility in the Russell today. These are 30 minute candles. We ran from 1507, which um, is a weekly trading zone, up to. 15, 14 and a half, and we have a weekly zone at 15, 16. So it's a weekly zone here. Fifteen, fifteen, and then we got a zone down below it at 0708. Last night, and we can at least take a look at this one. On the Russell, we said to consider being short 1485. Well, that didn't happen. So we're being pretty hopeful there. 1485, uh, consider buying 15 and a quarter. Yep, that's not happening either. Okay. Well, we did get our big move in crude, and we had a couple of nice moves in the S&P. Nice move in the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ, if it does continue higher, we could trigger to the upside. Gold ran up and hit the weekly zone at 
27, 20, or 77, 78, where it's consolidated a good part of the week. Here we went from zone to zone, back down to the zone, got really quiet. Couldn't even make it up that time. Then we get this move back up to the zone, and there we are consolidating at the zone. Soybeans left a lot to be desired. Short side, we were looking to be short at 65, yeah, and we put in a low at 63 half, so only a one and a half point move. Of course, there was no entry on a 30 minute chart. You might have found something on a five minute chart, but that doesn't change the fact that it only dropped a total of a point and a half. And so, chart wise, I think that's all be able to show you for now. <clears throat> S&P is still quietly sideways. Let's go to our good word for the day and I guess we'll wrap it there for this Friday. We've been talking all week about marriage, the cornerstone of an orderly society. And interestingly, on a TV show last night, I heard someone make the comment that the relationship between parents and their children were the cornerstone of an orderly society. Today, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It's pretty short. You can probably memorize it. In Adam, all die. Wow, that doesn't sound terribly encouraging, does it? Bible says, in Adam, all die. Why Adam? He was called to be the head of the first family. Therefore, he was responsible for what happened in the home. Men, listen up. As people, husbands and wives are equal under God. Okay, that's important to remember. Because sometimes, uh, in back you know, in the glorious Dynam days, the Bible was used as sort of a whipping post for putting women down and, and, and making men superior. But if you take the time to really uh, rightly divide the word of truth, then you'll see that it, that's not the case. Man has to take his responsibilities, woman takes her responsibilities. Man ultimately is responsible for the protection and care of the woman, but they are equal in God's eyes. As people, husbands and wives are equal under God. But in marriage, each has a different role. What happened in the first home was the result of two people wanting to live independently of God. That's the way many relationships function today. One or both partners choose to live their lives separately from God's rule and authority it shows up in the 36% divorce rate that we're experiencing. I'm shocked that it's only 36%. I think that's probably because so many people today don't even bother to get married. I don't know. I'm just saying. And that doesn't take into consideration that many who remain married say they're not happy and that they would not marry the same person again. Hmm. It's got to hurt to hear those words. Conflict arises when you and your spouse have different histories, learning styles, personalities, and backgrounds. One spouse might say, my father raised me like this, or my mother always did that. We all have our own idea of what makes up the knowledge of good and evil, what's right and what's wrong for a marriage. Everyone has an opinion. The problem is, you can spend your life arguing over opinions and get nowhere. I'll say that again. You can spend your life arguing over opinions and get nowhere. As followers of Christ, we're called to live our lives and build our marriages on biblical revelation, not personal institution. 
Adam's job was to get God's viewpoint on issues pertaining to life and family, then share it with the other members of the family. How? By being a loving husband and modeling godly leadership. When a home functions this way, God's blessing will be present. And so that mantle, that responsibility, according to God's divine order, falls on us men. Doesn't make the woman any less important. None whatsoever. But the mantle to establish the temperature of the home, the spiritual temperature, falls upon the man. Without a loving wife who supports him and believes in him, it's difficult for the man to do this. And so many men give up. We can't give up. It, it's, not, it's not so much what we say as it is how we live our life. The greatest sermon that any of us will ever preach is the life we live. Our neighbors, our co-workers, our spouses, our children, our employers, our employees, they hear us say all kinds of things. And, you know, usually in one ear and out the other. But they're watching you. They may or may not listen. They may or may not take what you say seriously. But they're watching you and they're watching you how you live your life. And that's ultimately what they're going to base their decision on about you, and that's going to be the hallmark of the relationship that you have with everyone. Not what you say, but how you live your life. And when it comes to your wife, when you have problems, when you're stressed out, when you don't know the answer, she'll quietly watch, and see where you go for guidance and direction for help, for peace of mind. And when she sees that repeatedly you go to God the Father and that you come away with the right answers, that you are obedient to the Word of God, that develops a new level of respect and Quite frankly, that can save a marriage. It can save a family. Children who've lost respect for their parents, that can be changed. Parents who've lost respect for their children, it can be changed. It all flows from the head down. God being the head, Christ, the husband, the father, the wife, the mother, all rolls downhill. So just ask yourself if things in your home and your marriage and your life are not exactly how you'd like them to be. What role are you playing in that? What role did you play to create the situation? And what role can you play? What can you do? Who can you talk to to turn things around? To make waking up each and every day, an exciting thing. Something you look forward to, not something you dread. We want to live a life where we leap out of bed before the alarm clock goes off, not pulling the covers over our head and just wishing the day would go away. That's not how God created us to enjoy and appreciate this wonderful thing called life. So I hope you'll take that to heart. I pray that your marriage will be strong. I pray that it will be a shining example in your community, in your church, among your friends, among your family. You'll be the ones, the role models that others turn and look at and go, man, I wish I had a marriage like that. They love each other, they trust each other, they confide in one another. They are each other's best friend. 
no higher honor than to be someone's best friend. So I'll leave you with that on this Friday, the 6th day of October, 2017. Please spend some quality time this weekend with your family, okay? Thanks for tuning in today. Whoever you are, wherever you are, may God continue to richly bless you with his mercy and with his grace. And I'll see you at the bell. Remember this, there is no greater return on investment than to see a human life changed and given hope. As always, pray hard and trade safe. Any financial information discussed on this show is simply the opinion of our host, Dwayne Reeves, his co-hosts and guests. To learn more about trading E-mini futures or to take a one-week free trial in our live trading room, call 1-866-928-3310. 866-928-3310. Information discussed on this radio program should not be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Always do your own due diligence and consult with a licensed securities broker or financial planner before making any investment decisions.